Um, many of you, in fact, most of you probably do know me, but for those who don't, my name's Aviva Douch. I'm the Executive Director of Jewish Renaissance Magazine and delighted to be working with the Alliance Learning Project to run this series on Jewish heritage in Southern England, um, particularly looking at Jewish country houses. Um, we've been um, having for the last few weeks speakers from the Oxford Country Houses Project. And then last week we diverted a little bit. Um, we diverted historically to medieval England and had Rebecca Abrams talk a little bit about Winchester particularly Licoritia of Winchester. Well, today we're returning to the South. We're returning to Sussex, but we are simultaneously going to France um, and Eastern Europe because we're going to be learning a little bit about Chagall. As many of you know, that next week or next Wednesday, we're going to be doing a trip out in person for those who can come along, both to the Jewish Country House Item Moat which is in Sussex. We might peep over the walls also of the Goldsmiths property, which was talked about in a session a couple of weeks ago. But while we're looking at the country houses, we're going to stop at a small chapel in Tudley. So Tudley, this little chapel in Tudley, out of the way, it's a tiny place, is the only place in England, in fact, I believe the only place in the world outside the Hazas Hospital, though I'm sure Monica is going to talk about this, that all the windows are stained glass and all designed by Chagall. So how on earth did this happen? What is the history of Chagall in England? And, and we're going to learn a little bit more about this chapel before we go visit it. So the person who's talking to us today, you many of you are very familiar with, um, it's Monica Baumdushan. You might know, sorry, you're absolutely right, it's Kent, not Sussex. I'm mixing up my counters. So thank you very much for the person who just direct messaged me. Um, but um, I've just lost my track. There we go. Monica, who is next to me now on the screen will be absolutely spot on geographically as well as historically. I know many of you know her as the founding director of Insiders Outsiders, the festival of emigre art, um, which has does many, many sessions and collaborates with Jewish Renaissance often, including last year on our Isle of Man project. But in her own right, Monica's not only a very fine art historian. She's been the arts commentator and reviewer from, for JR since we started 20 years ago. Um, but she's also a great teacher of arts and in fact tour leader. Um, mentioning Sussex earlier, she often leads tours of Sussex art um, um, for Martin Randall Travel, but she's also ta taught at Birkbeck um, at the New York University in London and many, many other places. So I'm really delighted to have Monica with us today and I'm going to pass over to her in a moment. She's going to give a lecture and then as usual we'll have a Q&A afterwards. So please put your questions in the chat and we'll call on you later on. Monica, over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Aviv, and thanks for inviting me to give this to give this talk. So I think without further ado, let me screen share. There we go. Um, all good? Yes? Fine. So, as, good, good. As Aviva has said, my main focus is indeed going to be on providing a wider context for the really rather remarkable set of windows we're going to visit next week. Um, how indeed does that church with all those windows, you know, how how did it come into being? What was the story behind it? Um, I've started with this slide because actually it's a beautiful quotation. I think you'll agree something that Chagall himself said about his work in the stained glass medium, a transparent partition between my heart and the heart of the world. He was also always slightly prone to <laughs> sentimentality, but in the nicest possible ways, I think you will see. So let me let me let me start properly. How does a young man for the most inauspicious of 
backgrounds, about which I'll say a little bit more, but you get a sense of it from that very early image here on the left of the screen. How does he get from there to the work done, inaugurated, unveiled in the late 1960s in the small Kent village of Tudorley? And look at the contrast in styles from the rather dour, dark, essentially naturalistic, tentative style of this early uh, image on the left to the confident, colourful, complex iconography of the stained glass window on the right. Now, I haven't got time to go into much detail about the colourful and, of, well, often tragic trajectory of his long life, but I think I must give you some pointers. So it's going to be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour in the first instance. Let me start with a map. Now, I think for an audience like this, I don't need to say what the Pale of Settlement was or indeed very much about it. But suffice it then to say that he was born, he was the eldest son in a large family of Yiddish speaking, Orthodox, well, actually Hasidic Orthodox. So that's, I mustn't go into too much detail here, but Hasidism is actually really important for the formative years of his life and development as an artist. Um, he always saw his art as being essentially intuitive and ecstatic, very much to do with the communion with the divinity, which is I think in large part, although one can't prove it, part of that Hasidic background. But certainly in the Pale of Settlement on the outskirts of the Belarusian, what is now the Belarusian town of Vitebsk, you can see it there sort of more or less sort of top uh, center of the map there, the province of Vitebsk, um, not an auspicious beginning. His parents had really never heard of the word art or artist. What they might have encountered was folk art, popular art, uh, signage. Indeed, his first experience of art was in that, in that domain. Um, but it's not the whole story, although his own immediate milieu had no idea what being an artist might have meant. His mother, and this is interesting, mothers often are the ones who sort of understand their son's ambitions, their children's ambitions. His mother made it possible, they were very, not quite on the breadline, but certainly not, not in any way affluent, but she made it possible for her young, artistically ambitious son to become a student at the Yehuda Penn School of Art in the town of Vitebs. Now, Penn is a very interesting character on another occasion, maybe I can tell you more about him, but he was in fact one of the earliest of the Russian Jewish artist to make his mark in the cultural mainstream of that country, which was generally so very hostile to the Jewish population. Um, one should also perhaps just very quickly say that at one point as a young man, when Chagall was in uh, St. Petersburg trying to make a go of it, as an artist, he was actually flung into jail for a night for not having the requisite uh, residence permits. You get some idea, I don't really have to say more of how many hurdles, both practical and psychological, the young Chagall had to overcome in order to fulfill his artistic ambitions. I'm going to just, I, I've chosen a few what I see as quite key examples, particularly pertinent to this later interest in the stained glass medium. But even here, you see, this is an early work. He's already, in fact, dividing his time between Vitebsk and St. Petersburg. Look at the difference. If you think back to that early, the old lady image I just showed you, rather dour and dark. This is a curious image. I wish I had time to go into the iconography, but I don't. It's clearly quirky, both in iconography, but also in style. Look at this acidic lemon colored sky that marks an interest in an emphatic, not necessarily naturalistic use of colour, which of course comes to the fore with a vengeance in the stained glass medium. I told you it's a whistle stop tour. <laughs> in 1910, thereabouts, he was able to get to the place where all aspiring artists needed to get to in the early 20th century, namely Bohemian Paris. And this work is perhaps the most telling of all the images he produced during that very, very fertile four year period from about 1910 to 1914, which show him grappling and engaging creatively with this heady new environment. He's looking at cubism, but he's also looking at the heightened color, perhaps of Fauvism, of Van Gogh in quite a lot of this early Paris work. Notice also, um, I don't know if you can actually see my cursor, I think perhaps you can, but in the top right hand corner, well on the left you've got don't have to tell you, the Eiffel Tower is the sort of iconic symbol of Paris and new freedoms opening up on all fronts. But look on the top right, it's the main cathedral of his native town of Vitebsk. And this is important because of course, when we're talking about stained glass, in relation to Chagall, although some of the uh, locations for the stained glass were indeed non-religious, they were secular, but the huge majority were actually done for the Christian church. And what I suppose I'm getting at here is that this um, complex relationship, but also a fascination with Christian iconography, with 
Christian culture, Christian religion is there very early on indeed. Just in case you're wondering about the seven fingers, uh, this is made sense of by the fact that there's an idiom in Yiddish, which was very much his, his mother tongue, his first language, uh, which uh, goes something like to do something with seven fingers means to do something with all your heart and soul. This is an interesting one, also done, in fact, slightly before the previous one, when he first gets to Paris. And it's almost as though it anticipates in its sort of highly colored, but also splintered uh, stylistic um, strategies, some of the work he would much, much later go on to do in stained glass, but it is also, of course, as you can see, very much a harking back, a referencing of uh, some of the things he would have experienced back in, in Russia. Another work from this first Paris period, which I think um, proves, demonstrates this, this complex relationship with the Christian host environment, uh, pregnant woman or maternity, clearly influences, you can see by this juxtaposition and rather cheekily uh, referring to the uh, great icon tradition that you see represented on the right, whereby the Christ child is a medallion on the Madonna's on, on Mary's uh, chest. And he, she, you know, he transposes the, the baby to the rightful place in the pregnant woman's belly. So uh, complex, sometimes subversive, certainly always complicated, that relationship. In 1914, he's given his first one-man exhibition in Berlin, not in Paris, interestingly enough, by Herbert Walden, whose real name was Levin. Again, you know, it's fascinating to see how many of the figures who are prominent in advancing Chagall's career were indeed of Jewish origin. Uh, again, not enough time for detail, but suffice it to say that Chagall quite understandably wanted to go there for the vernissage, for the opening. He heads back, he heads east to, to, to Berlin for the opening, which makes a small but significant mark on the cultural scene. And then he decides to go back continue eastwards to his native Vitebsk, where he wants to pick up the uh, threads of a by now slightly um, fading relationship with his very beautiful girlfriend, Bella. I think if you saw these images, you would not necessarily think they were by Chagall. They're certainly very different to nearly all of his other work, but they're, they're rather wonderful. They're very small, powerful, quite expressionistic, an evocation of the scenes that he would have encountered when he was trapped in Vitebsk by the outbreak of the First World War. And he stayed there into the early 20s. You know, when he first went, he thought he would whisk Bella back to Paris and, you know, live happily ever after in, in France. It was not to be. And again, without going into too much detail, or without going into any detail at all, I think this one's an interesting one. Again, you probably not recognize it as a Chagall work out of context. But for a brief while, come the Russian Revolution, he's fired up with a huge enthusiasm as a Jew, as a human being, as an artist, for the freedoms that seem to be beckoning. And here he is throwing his lot in with the Bolshevik regime, creating his most overtly <laughs> leftist propagandist work of his career. Things turn sour very quickly, though, because as I think you can see from, well, any of the images so far, and certainly from this one here, the kind of whimsical, fantastical imagery that Chagall was so um, expert at didn't go down very well with the Soviet authorities. And essentially, to cut a very long and unpleasant story short, he was forced to resign from the Vitebsk Art Academy from his responsibilities as a teacher and administrator, left Vitebsk forever, as it turned out, he wasn't to know that, and finds employment, at least for a little while, in the state Yiddish chamber theatre in Moscow. And it's in Moscow that he produces this and some smaller accompanying panels for the small chamber theatre. Extraordinarily complex composition, as you can see. What I wanted really, though, to plug in particular here is that this is the very first time that he has a chance to work on a monumental scale and he absolutely reveled in it and of course that in terms of what happens in his later career is also very significant. Well jumping forward now with the vengeance from 1920 to the late 1930s in the early 20s, he's able to go back by then with his wife Bella and young daughter Ida to his beloved Paris. And the 20s are probably the most serene and tranquil and unturbulent uh, period in his entire long career. And then, of course, in the 1930s, uh, storm clouds are gathering in Europe with a vengeance. And 
his work reflects this, not all the time, but increasingly so as the 1930s progress. And here's an extraordinary work from the Art Institute uh, in Chicago, which shows the beginning of a very kind of concerted and actually extended preoccupation with the figure of a Jewish Jesus, which kind of picks up on the thread I've already hinted at, this sort of preoccupation with Christianity and particularly the notion of Jesus as a Jew that one sees intermittently in his early work, but that becomes really very, very important in his overall output from the 1930s right through to the 1950s, as we, um, in fact, will we'll, we'll see, and, and, and beyond, although the emphasis shifts. So look at it, Jewish talit, uh, and so on and so forth, accompanied by scenes that relate directly to the terrible things that are happening to the Jews of Europe in the late 1930s. And so it was that Having initially thought he, he'd actually become a French citizen in 1937, he thought, I'm doing well, I'm French now, I don't have to worry. But of course, when push comes to shove, as they say, uh, when the, um, the war starts, when the Germans invade France, when uh, there's Vichy, then, you know, events unfold in the most terrible way. And Chagall is at one point having gone down, in fact, to the south of France. He's actually arrested by the Gestapo and realises whether he likes it or not that it's time to leave troubled Europe. And he goes with the help of somebody called Varian Fry, a wonderful unsung, largely unsung hero of Chagall's story, but also of, of wartime history, wartime cultural history. Uh, more generally, he manages to escape over the Pyrenees, believe it or not, into neutral Spain and thence ultimately to the safety of New York. He never learns English, he's never at home in an Anglophone culture. Uh, nevertheless, it saved his life and that of his, his family. Once more, I'm choosing a key example here to demonstrate this work on a large scale that prefigures, if you like, his work in the stained glass medium. Uh, a wonderful project, as I think you can see from just this, this one design for the American Ballet Theatre, which actually involved going to Mexico, where again, he was much uh, impressed and enamored by the colorful nature of, of the local culture and customs. Um, there was, uh, I believe, one review that praised these designs very, um, uh, very strongly, but actually said it was a shame that the dancers got in the way because they blocked the view <laughs> of the stage sets. And I think you can you can actually see what uh, what they were after. And then back back to France. It was actually in 1948 that he, uh, Bella, in the meantime, had tragically died very young in the early 40s in America. Um, and he was absolutely bereft, but he did actually team up for about seven years with a young English woman, actually, Virginia Haggard, uh, related to Ryder Haggard of King Solomon's Mines. And then she actually uh, leaves him when they go back to France in the late 40s. And he teams up, I have to say, rather promptly with another woman like Bella of Russian Jewish origin called Vava or Valentina Brodsky. And uh, they, she, he comes back in the 40s. He, uh, is safe, he's survived. The world of his childhood, of course, has gone forever. Very few members of his family, his home community, of course, did survive the Holocaust. And he makes France his home for the rest of his life. And I think it's very interesting here looking at this apparently quite serene image, isn't it? The bridal figure is often, certainly on one profound level, a homage to his recently deceased muse and wife. Bella. But, you know, look there, you've got the Eiffel Tower, France, home in a sense is another home. And then look at the street scene on the bottom, these two worlds coexisting. This is undoubtedly a reference to the humble, low-lying houses of his native Vitebsk, where, his, where the Jewish community largely, largely lived. So it's Back in France, after the First World War, that his work for the church, his work in the stained glass medium really begins. And not just in the stained glass medium, as I hope to show you, as I plan to show you right now, he's, it's an extraordinary thing, you know, in the mid to late 50s, I, I don't know if I actually gave you his birth date, 1887, so he's in his 60s and increasingly into his 70s, that he's working, pulling out all the stops in a wide range of, of different media at a time when I suppose many of us would be thinking about taking it just a little bit easy. It is quite a remarkable fact. Um, so where to start? I think a good place is with this rather 
peculiar edifice. It's in a magnificent location. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to see it. It's not far from Chamonix in the French Alps. Um, this is a fascinating project which warrants a whole uh, session really in its own right in terms of kind of interfaith um, projects of the period. It was initiated by a Dominican um, priest called uh, Père Couturier um, and he, like many others at the time, felt it was imperative after the upheavals and indeed the traumas of the Second World War to inject new life into the Christian church by roping in as many contemporary artists as possible. And what was really significant for Chagall and indeed others, that it didn't actually matter, in his opinion, what religion or indeed whether the artist had any religion at all. So for example, in the church at Assi, the rather colorful facade is designed by Fernand Léger, who is a self-confessed atheist. Many, many artists were involved, but let me just focus on Chagall and an important um, colleague and uh, associate of his. So on the left then, not stained glass yet, it is a kind of tile, a ceramic um, tile um, composition that you can see a topic that uh, preoccupied him greatly in the post-war period, as we will already will get a taste of. Um, and then on the left, in the same church at Assi, Jacques Lipschitz of, um, as you probably know, also Russia, well, Russian uh, Jewish origin, a sculpture that meets you in the church, the descent of the Holy Spirit. But look at the inscription that I've put at the bottom there, yes, in the name of the liberty of all religions. And then another, inscription on the same same plinth there. Jacob Lipschitz, Jew, faithful to the faith of his ancestors, has made this virgin for the goodwill of all mankind that the spirit may prevail. And I think although this is not Chagall himself talking, Chagall absolutely subscribed to this kind of universalist brotherhood of man kind of um, ideal that uh, Lipschitz is expressing here. I should say that actually he had quite a few uh, Christian and Catholic friends who felt that he was somehow kind of almost like a, a Christian monkey. And I don't think that's the case. I think this very much sums up how, you know, how he felt about his relationship to, to the church. So, cutting to the chase now, just his interest in the stained glass medium. We know that he first visited the magnificent stained glass windows of Chartres Cathedral, not far from Paris, in 1952 was absolutely bowled over by them. And indeed, how could you, how could you not be? And this is just a reminder of how magnificent they are. We also know that he couldn't possibly have done all the magnificent work in stained glass that he was to produce from the late 50s onwards, had it not been for the assistance of in fact, a husband and wife team uh, called Charles Marc and Brigitte Marc, who had taken over, I think, from his father, the Atelier Jacques Simon in Reims, also in northern France, of course, with a magnificent uh, medieval cathedral of its own. And here, with apologies for the, uh, <laughs> the photo agency uh, uh, watermark, here are, are ph photographs of the facade. It's rather kind of quirky uh, atelier that he became very familiar with. And I think it's really important to acknowledge the craftsmen, not just in the stained glass medium, and it's not true just of Chagall, but of all artists like you know, Picasso, Miro, you name it, the big guns of modern art, who in the latter part of their career did work in a whole range of different media, but they couldn't have done it without the hard work and the commitment of the master and mistress <laughs> crafts, craftsmen, craftswomen that they, uh, they worked alongside. That's really important, I think. So here, and apologies for the rather distorted, rather peculiar image on the uh, bottom right there, um, but uh, here's Chagall with these very expressive hands of his uh, with the two people I've just mentioned um, and top right, a rather better quality image showing him at work in this atelier in, in Reims. So they became his kind of companions in arms really to make it possible to um, take on and indeed accomplish and complete the ambitious complex commissions that were to come in ever greater numbers from the uh, mid 1950s onwards. Now I've got here and I'm not sure this works. Hmm, I have a feeling, let, let me see if it works on, on Zoom. It certainly worked when I was, yes, it's a silent, very short film. Is that, is that visible? Aviva, is, is that visible? Yes, it is. It's fantastic. fantastic. Okay. Just watch carefully. Very short, silent, but it gives you some interesting insights.
there we go. Good, I'm glad that uh, that worked. Let me uh, hopefully move on to, oh, I just had a feeling this might, let's just see what happens. Yes, there we go. Um, good, um, that's quite vivid, isn't it? Albeit without words. Um, certainly proof of what I was getting at that you know you couldn't have done what he did without the assistance of these real experts in the medium. It's also worth mentioning here, I think, just a few words about this matter of technique. Um, you can see that he's painting in effect, isn't he? He's painting on the stained glass leaded panels, almost as if on a canvas. And I think that gives his work in stained glass this extraordinary kind of fluidity and fluency that makes, you know, marks it apart from really almost any other practitioner's work in that in that medium. Um, I should say, I mean, I think, you know, even going back to the um, uh, the chart windows that I showed you, albeit in no detail there, that traditionally, of course, each area bound by the lead canes, as they're called, the lead um, strips, um, is of a single colour, unmodified, yes? So in other words, it is the lead that defines the colours and the shapes of the window, whereas, as we'll see very shortly, um, uh, really lead is used in Chagall's case in a much more, again, a much more sort of fluent and almost spontaneous, uh, and not arbitrary exactly, but perhaps I can still use that word, um, fashion. And also to mention a technique that was actually used for red glass, apparently in medieval times. And I have to say, I'm not a technical expert in the stained glass medium. So forgive me if I get, you know, if I oversimplify and hopefully won't get it garbled though. But apparently there's a technique known as flashed glass, which uh, the Marc, uh, Charles Marc in particular became an absolute expert in, which essentially is using um, transparent glass um, with a very thin sheet of colored glass attached to one surface, which can actually be modified much more easily. So what is achievable by this uh, innovative technique across all the color range is modulation of color um, uh, within you know, a, single, a single plate of glass, which allowed Chagall a magnificent and necessary freedom, I think. So you'll see what I mean better when we look at more examples of his work. His first major uh, commission came indeed from the Catholic, from the French Catholic Church, from um, in the northeast town of, in Alsace-Lorraine, I think it is, of Metz. Saint-Étienne, St. Stephen, one of the most magnificent you know, edifices in the Christian in the Christian world intact today. It's often, you know, it's a treasure trove of stained glass from many, many different periods. So what an extraordinary thing from this, you know, little boy from Vitebsk, this little Jewish boy from Vitebsk to be given a commission. And uh, I'm, I'm grinning slightly because it's very interesting to note that, I'm not sure exactly at which point it was, but we know that at one point Chagall actually was obviously flattered to be asked, but also rather perturbed and concerned about the um, ethics, if that's the word, uh, the morality of a Jewish artist taking on a major or any Christian commission of, of this sort. And the story is that he actually wrote to the chief rabbi of Israel asking if it was okay. And the chief rabbi of Israel rather perhaps tolerantly said, well, actually, yes, if in your heart this feels right to you, you, you know, go ahead with my blessing. But the very fact that he saw fit, he felt it necessary to get the blessing of the chief rabbi, I think is quite telling, is it, is it not? So, um, Again, it's useful, I think, just uh, for purposes of comparison uh, to see this is this is just one detail of the stained glass uh, from a much, much earlier period. And here's Chagall's, one of the works, the, the, or the sort of sets of windows that Chagall um, produces. And if I can just, you know, I mean, it's very obvious, isn't it, that uh, the, the you know, I suppose you know the, the, the lead has a, has a life of its own, isn't it? It has a kind of rhythmic quality which is uh, intrinsic to the composition and which you don't find traditionally, however wonderful these are. You know, you do not find that particular characteristic in, in earlier periods. Uh, now, there's an awful lot to look at. I mean, just look at, you know, again, the complexity of the design, the complexity of the colours, um, and indeed the iconography. Um, worth... Uh, mentioning that almost without, well, yes, with, with the notable exception of the figure of Christ himself, who he clearly, as I've said, saw as a Jewish martyr figure, um, Chagall only produces images, Old Testament images, even when he's working for the Christian church, which I think, again, is, is, is significant. 
And here's another actually rather easier to see. You've got Moses, you've got the creation of man, Jacob's ladder, um, yeah, Jacob fighting with the angel. You're the, I think many of you will will recognize the motifs again from from Metz. So this, you know, for somebody who's just beginning really to work with the stained glass medium, they are an extraordinary accomplishment. I think there's absolutely no doubt about that. Now, interestingly, and look how different, and oh my goodness, if you had to think of a contrast between Metz Cathedral or indeed any medieval European cathedral and this rather modest and, 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 and basic structure, which I imagine many of you will have visited, um, what actually happens is that actually, as he's working on the Metz Commission, he's soon also commissioned to produce the windows for the Hadassah Medical Center. The only, and this is again fascinating, this is actually the only synagogue he ever received a commission for. Why is that? Uh, let me perhaps go to the next uh, image here. You can ponder this as I'm talking. Um, I haven't talked about the taboo on the graven image, the uh, potency, if you like, of the second commandment. But of course, in the synagogue context, even though most Jews in the modern period have taken little heed of that taboo, as certainly as artists, uh, nevertheless, in the synagogue context, one does not find the human figure. And what he ends up doing, as you probably uh, are aware, in the Hadassah, 12 windows, all equal in size, with different dominating uh, color schemes, he actually depicts the 12 tribes of Israel, but with reference to flora and fauna. Yeah, um, so he could have done that elsewhere, but it's, it's a curious conundrum and something that I don't have an easy answer for. You know, why is it that nobody else in the Jewish world actually commissioned this most famous of Jewish artists to create stained glass for a synagogue. So this remains, you know, just going back to this here, um, I went many years ago and then I revisited recently and the Hadassah has grown up exponentially all around it, but they still are very proud of the windows, but the actual building is almost lost amid the huge explosion of new buildings that have built, been built around it. Uh, nevertheless, if you haven't been, it is well worth a visit in the hills um, outside Jerusalem. And, and there it is. And as you can see, it's a very modest, I mean, in terms of architecture, I don't think anybody can pretend that it's a great masterpiece and stands perhaps as a slightly embarrassing contrast, dare I say it, you know, to the magnificence of the um, Christian churches. But uh, I'll leave that one <laughs> aside for the moment. And I thought you might like to just see what he himself said in, a, in an inaugural speech at the opening of the Hadassah, uh, of, of the synagogue in 1962, this sort of, again, a wonderfully idealistic, utopian, possibly slightly naive, but, you know, why not, <laughs> sort of appeal to the brotherhood of man and indeed for understanding, you know, among the Jewish community of other, other Semitic peoples, as he rather tactfully puts it. Here's another um, uh, photograph of the Hadassah synagogue. And you can see, of course, how the nature of the light flooding through the time of day, the weather conditions transforms. It's very obvious, but you know, in any stained glass uh, commission, this is absolutely crucial. And you can get a sense of how indeed the stained glass you know, completely transforms this very modest and low key interior. Also, I think interesting to see some sketches for Naftali and Levy, these wonderfully fluent, almost, you know, kind of, you know, almost flowing out of him, aren't they, these sketches, which he then actually works, of course, and when he's happy with them to serve as preparatory sketches, as we saw the Mark uh, team then do, in fact, transpose the sketches onto a much, much larger scale uh, for Chagall's in uh, approval, then transposed to the stained glass medium, um, uh, but with Chagall then putting the essential finishing touches, you know, through the hand painted medium um, to, to, to make the works, you know, what they, what they are. Now, I wanted here just to sort of step sideways slightly and look at this imagery in a different context. This is going way, way back to his time in Russia. I've told you, didn't I, early on, that he was trapped in Russia by the First World War. And one of the things that's actually very interesting in terms of Jewish culture um, about that period in Russia is that he became part of a group of artists, and Lizitsky was one, Isikar Rybak here, who became very, very fascinated by Jewish folk art, the art of the decorated, the sort of quite humble wooden synagogues of the Vitebsk region, which were nevertheless painted quite flamboyantly and in great detail in the interior. And here we have an example of one of his Jewish colleagues in Russia, 1916, 
depicting some of the motifs that they so much admired and wanted to kind of transpose into their own art. And I think you can see without me taking that further, I mean, look at the motif here, yes, the two figures there, for example, that actually so many decades later, Chagall is revisiting and paying homage in a sense to the world of the Jewish synagogues of Russia, which of course were utterly destroyed in the Holocaust. On the subject of Israel, um, it's important also, I think, just to mention briefly that on the back of the uh, Hadassah Commission, he was very promptly um, invited, and he said yes with alacrity, to produce not um, stained glass, but actually three tapestries and several mosaics. Um, I think it's 12 floor mosaics and one large um, uh, wall mosaic for the new parliament building. I'm sure many of you will know it. And I said, you have to make a special uh, arrangement to go in, but I strongly recommend it. So, you know, his allegiance to Israel Israel is, is undoubtedly strong, even though he never decided to, to settle there. Okay, now one thing I haven't mentioned is that in 1962 there was a very important um, exhibition of the preparatory sketches for the Hadassah windows at the Louvre, no less. So again, this is a mark of how hugely respected and how successful Chagall has been on the world stage, if you like, on the uh, in mainstream culture. And among the people who visited that exhibition were uh, Peggy and David Rockefeller. And they, in due course, invited Chagall to produce a window for a church that they were instrumental in commissioning a whole lot of works for in upstate New York, Hudson Valley. And here it is. And I think you know it's worth saying that all this, in some ways, is perhaps the closest counterpart, um, in terms of the architecture at least, to Tudeling, which I shall come to at the very end of my talk. Several different artists were involved, so it's not the same as Tudeling, as uh, Aviv has already indicated, but uh, you'll already, I think, be struck by this um, shot of the interior at the stylistic contrast between the rose window on the uh, on the far wall and the Chagall windows on the sides. And in case you're wondering who that uh, window is by, it's by Matisse. And I think this is interesting. Uh, uh, Again, uh, Chagall still iconographically complex, uh, Matisse reductive, quite reminiscent of his late paper cutouts that he was doing at the same sort of time. And I also wanted to just interpose here uh, a wonderful experience if you have a chance in the south of France, not far from Nice, the Chapelle du Rosaire, um, again, actually uh, overseen by Pierre Couturier, who's behind the Assi project, so there are these interesting personal connections as well, uh, that Matisse masterminded. I mean, he designed everything down to the smallest detail, but look how very, very different it is to Chagall's approach. Simple, beautiful in its own very different way. And then just very briefly, a close-up of the Good Samaritan um, window at uh, uh, Pocantico, and uh, it's been suggested, which is an interesting surmise, that maybe the theme of the Good Samaritan appealed to him as a kind of homage to Varian Fry, the uh, American man who helped get the Chagall family out of wartime France. It's, it's a possibility, I think. Now, again, stepping sideways, but I think this is really interesting. This is Canterbury Cathedral, so we are uh, now back in this country. Um, I don't know how many of you will have um, noticed these. They are actually pretty, you know, strongly coloured, hard to not notice, but you probably won't have known they were by somebody called Irvin Bossani, who is a Hungarian Jewish refugee to this country. Now, that in itself is interesting, the number of other you know, Jewish artists in the 20th century who have worked for the church, but I wanted to mention it for a very particular reason. Um, so you've got salvation on uh, one side on the left and uh, peace on the right. Have I got that? No, I think it's the other. Yes, I think I think that's right. Um, and uh, here are close ups. Now, this is extraordinary because you would not know it at all if you if I didn't tell you because there's so much detail uh, and you couldn't see it from down below anyway. But if you look very, very carefully at it's this, um, it's just above here, isn't it? It's that portion there and here's the close up. It's a padlock that's been wrenched open and on the padlock you'll have to take, well, you can probably see for yourselves, is a swastika. This extraordinarily personal, intimate detail by this Hungarian Jewish former refugee artist to allude quite directly to his own escape from the clutches of the Nazis. Interesting, no? Okay, to continue, I must watch um, the time. Uh, now, thereafter, Chagall is much in demand all over the Western world, for sure. Um, 
not just in a Christian context, as you can see here, the so-called peace window at the UN building, a homage to the uh, recently deceased um, Doug Hammarskjöld, the Secretary uh, General of the United Nations, um, full of imagery that is actually familiar both, you know, from other work in stained glass, but also from his uh, post-war paintings. And again, just um, adding a work not in the stained glass medium, a reminder of how hugely in demand he is. He was very much the grand old man of uh, modern art at this latter point of his career, two magnificent uh, murals or paintings, one should perhaps more strictly say, monumental paintings at the Lincoln, the Metropolitan Opera House in uh, New York City. Uh, again, secular subjects, uh, a tribute to uh, America, uh, donated to the Art Institute of Chicago. And there is actually a very interesting nine minute film, which I could give Aviva or Emma the link to, to send out to you. It's well worth um, uh, watching because it talks about all sorts of things, but actually about his technique in quite illuminating sorts of ways. It's also worth mentioning that when he was working in the stained glass medium, he very rarely accepted any payment, particularly when it was for a place of worship. So this wasn't for filthy lucre, not at all. It was very much something he felt compelled to do. Uh, again, not stained glass, but from the same sort of period, the magnificent ceiling of the Paris uh, Opera, uh, teeming with imagery, celebrating this kind of intense joie de vivre, the sort of belief in the power of uh, dance and music, and of course, the visual arts as well. And very quickly, I'm just sort of giving you a tantalizing taste, I think, of his work in other media in this period. Uh, another wonderful place, if you on the south of France, just up the hill from the Promenade des Anglais, the purpose-built museum, National Museum, of the biblical message, Marc Chagall, uh, where, again, the work was donated entirely by Chagall himself, comprising a whole series of magnificent monumental canvases um, on Old Testament themes, Genesis and um, Exodus. Notice once more the Jewish Jesus crucified, yes, motif here, the medieval Jewish, also Byzantine motif of the divinity, you know, without actually showing God directly, and so on and so forth. There's also in a, an adjacent room a wonderfully lyrical and uh, hotly coloured um, series of works slightly later, um, illustrating, evoking perhaps is a better word, <laughs> the biblical Song of Songs. And also at the museum in Nice, work in mosaic again, the uh, Elijah, Mosaic, incorporating the Zodiac, and also something I haven't yet mentioned, that at this period, he's, as I say, he's really more active than ever, quite extraordinary. He's trying his hand at sculpture, at stone carving, and also at ceramics. There's a wonderful uh, photograph of him and Picasso, actually, in Valoris, which was a ceramic center not far from the East, you know, friendly rivals, shall we say, both working away in that medium. And another reason I mentioned the museum in Nice is that there is a beautiful auditorium where they have concerts. There's actually a harpsichord decorated by Chagall, but also these wonderful uh, windows um, on the general theme of the creation. And I think this is very, very interesting. Look at this. It's almost abstract, isn't it? That he's actually working in a quite intuitive, quasi abstract way um, towards the final design for, for this window. And it is probably one of the most abstract um, windows he ever created. Okay, and so to Tudely. Now, I'm not going to say a huge amount about it. Obviously, I will say something right now, but I would very much hope that what I'm telling you today will provoke those of you who haven't booked to join us next week to do so, because I have to say there is absolutely no substitute whatsoever for actually being in there and seeing the windows for yourselves. But look at it. I mean, it's a modest English parish church. From the outside, you can't see the colour. That's, of course, the case with stained glass. Uh, you have to go inside to see it properly. Um, it's not even properly signposted. There are one or two uh, little brown signs that, you know, if you're lucky, you might notice. So it's quite extraordinary, actually, how little the local uh, parish make of this extraordinary treasure in their midst. Uh, here's another view of it. And uh, there's the east window. and here is, as I say, a work that, oh, an image that barely does justice to the magic of the interior. Because most of the other windows, you get a 
inkling of this are actually predominantly yellow so you get this sort of flood of you know sort of sunlight color sort of coming coming through and here's a much better image of the east window so let me just tell you very briefly something about this um it's the most complex of the windows it's the first one that he uh, completed basically the initiative or the commission came from the david Dor goldschmidt family one of the um rich certainly yes i mean super affluent jewish families of the period that indeed the jewish country houses project is much concerned with and their house summerhill is actually just a few minutes drive from tudorly and we're hoping to be able to at least see it from the outside on our trip next week um an interesting setup there because the father was in fact jewish the mother was not but in fact the mother and her daughter, who was also very interested in art and Chagall's art in particular, had visited the exhibition at the Louvre that I mentioned in 1962 of the preparatory sketches for um, the Hadassah windows, and they absolutely adored what they saw. And then just a few years later, tragedy struck. Sarah, the daughter, age only 21, died in a sailing accident just off the coast of Rye, in the south coast of England and distraught the parents turned to Chagall already not young already you know much in demand with or busy with other projects and they implored him begged him asked him to create a memorial window for their drowned daughter and I think you can see it's a sort of interesting mixture of all sorts of different images but here very simply is the drowning or drowned figure you know, sort of immersed in the waters, but with a promise perhaps of salvation, redemption, even resurrection, yes, embodied by the figure of the ladder, uh, on the ladder as she ascends upwards. So it is, uh, I suppose it is ultimately an essentially Christian image of hope and redemption, but, you know, with this very specific sort of personal kind of um, context to it. And uh, Chagall, um, actually came for the unveiling he well he agreed obviously <laughs> he completed it in the late 1960s he was so um entranced with the setting that he actually apparently volunteered to uh, replace the well the nondescript other smaller windows of the church with with his own designs and thereby as Aviva has said it is actually the only religious building in the world apart from the Hadassah or certainly only Christian building in the world with sugar with the entirely uh decorated by sugar and just uh, beginning to round off now, the other place that you need to go to if you are keen to find out more, to see more in England and uh, not actually that far from, from Tudor, which is actually in Kent, but in the lovely uh, market town, cathedral town of Chichester in Sussex, another very beautiful medieval structure for those of you who don't know it, here, here it is. Uh, this is actually a very interesting project. Let me just um, show you a few more. The um, Dean of the cathedral, just take a look at these. Um, in the period under question, um, he actually replaced somebody called George Bell, who I mustn't go on, but George Bell is really interesting because not only did he was he interested in um like like the French counterpart, interested in roping in contemporary art into the church, the post-war church, but he also actually helped save quite a lot of uh Jewish or if you like non-Aryan Christians in some case from Nazi Europe and one case in point is the artist who produced the baptism of Christ here on the right which is just immediately to the right as you enter the cathedral Hans Feibusch who was in fact a, a Jewish artist later converted to um to the Church of England partly after uh, under George Bell's influence and then actually converted back to Judaism in the latter part of his career but he's actually really interesting in terms of Jewish artists working for for the church um so there he is and there's Graham Sutherland John Piper you know some of the great names of post-war art actually commissioned by somebody who takes over from George Bell uh namely Walter Hussey and this is the window that Mark Chagall is commissioned very late in life. I mean, he really is an old man by this time. Uh, for Chichester Cathedral, it's at the far end. If you go up to the altar and look to the left, you will see it. It's uh, an explosion of, of magnificent, hot, vibrant colour. Uh, again, not really illustrated, but evoking the text, if you like, of Psalm 150. 
And going back to his very, or the later paintings of the period, I think it's quite interesting to see the kind of um, reciprocal relationship between Chagall's work in the stained glass medium and his paintings, I think, you know, with these blocks of, albeit modulated colour, you can see that he's feeding back, if you like, some of his uh, work in the stained glass medium back into the painted surface. And um, almost coming to an end now, this was his very last stained glass project. Unfinished, it was finished by somebody else after his death. But what I think is very interesting, and maybe you've already twigged what I'm about to say, it's the only stained glass project he ever did for Germany. And we know from his own writings, from other people's accounts, that actually he had problems with this. He was very uncertain, well, certainly ambivalent, as to whether he should be, as a Jewish artist with these strong, terrible Holocaust, you know, uh, related experiences, whether he should indeed be working in Germany. And he overcame, in the end, he overcame these misgivings, and he produced these, again, rather magnificent, predominantly blue windows for the Church of St. Stephan in, in Mainz. Now, I don't know if you've done your, your maths, your, your sort of dates uh, calculations, but, you know, by this time, born in 1887, a very, very old man, he continued working till the very end, admittedly now, you know, he's, what is he, he's nine, yeah, 90 plus, 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 he's, he's working with a more quavering hand, mostly in colour, but this is a rather beautiful, um, uh, very late uh, uh, I think it's a drawing or possibly a print, actually. It's, it's hard to tell, uh, um, uh, a lithograph, probably, um, which shows the young Chagall painting one of his intensely romantic images with that hovering figure, the angelic figure, you know, that kind of idea of artistic inspiration and divine inspiration being not very uh, separate from each other. And very lastly, uh, here's the tomb, the grave, He's buried in together with his second wife, Vava, and also her brother, I think I'm right in saying, in the very beautiful, I mean, you can see, you can see the setting. It's at the very edge of the small town inland from Nice, Saint Paul de Vence, where he lived at the very end of his life. Um, but it's a Christian cemetery. How come? I don't have an easy answer to that. It is, I think, very um, poignant, though, to see, isn't it? There are no flowers, but just... Every time I go, there are at least one, sometimes many more stones, as in the Jewish tradition, of course, as you'll know, placed on his grave. Um, and I will also say, although, in fact, it was a Christian ceremony, at one point, a young man, an anonymous young man, stepped forward and said the Monas Kaddish in Hebrew. So in other words, the contradictions, the ambivalences, the ambiguities of his relationship to Christianity, to his own Judaism, his own sense of Jewishness, you know, they, 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 they go on in a sense beyond his, his, uh, his own death. Thank you very much indeed. I'll stop, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Monica. That's um, a wonderful talk, which gives us the context of his stained glass work, as well as some tantalising glimpses into Tudley um, and that story. Now, lots of very interesting things have come up um, on the chat as you've been talking. Um, one of them isn't a question, mm -hmm. but I'm going to... Um, unlike unusually take a statement or invite Gita Khan to come onto the screen because she wrote something really interesting as um you were talking about Hadassah Hospital. Yes, so Gita, please, please. would you like to <laughs> talk to us a little bit? Well it's not a great revelation I'm afraid Aviva. Yes I met Chagall, but I was so young, I didn't appreciate what a big deal it was. Mm. I went as a young person, I went to Israel and I was se English secretary to the English architect, and he was called Chapman, of Hadassah Hospital, HRM, and also to the American consultant. So Chagall came to inspect his windows, I think by that time he'd finished them, and to talk to the architect. And I'm so ashamed that I never even got his autograph, let alone um, an anecdote that I could tell on an occasion like this. But I can say that I met him. He was very old and I was very young. Yeah. And I just, you know, I just managed to meet him. And it was a great honour and privilege. But that's all, all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did you get any sense at mm. all of kind of 
his pride was Hadassah special to him because it was Israel or was there any sense of what it meant to him as a project I don't I didn't talk to him well he exuded a warmth mm. he was just a lovely old man I mean I seem to remember he had hair in his ears you know the thought of <laughs> he would notice this. but you know I as I say I shall go to the grave uh, regretting that I didn't <laughs> grasp the opportunity I mean I'm known to be very inquisitive. I talk to people in Tesco's or anywhere, and yet there I meet this great man. And I didn't say a word. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for a lovely little lovely, anecdote. Lovely oh, thank you, Monica, because I adore his work, and that was a lovely lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. For those wonderful images. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that was just a little story, but we do have some questions. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm going to go, there's, a, there's an interesting one here, picking up on what you said about the Christian tradition. Um, it's slightly left field, mm. but I think actually relevant and interesting, particularly for those of us who are interested in culture as a whole, relationship between art and literature. So I'm going to bring Angela Gluck on screen. First of all, thank you so much. That was really magnificent, a uh, uh, tour de force. Um, very early on, as you were speaking, and you introduced us to um, the, the, the Jewish Jesus with the, with the talit as a kind of loincloth, um, I was reminded of Chaim Potok's uh, novel, mm -hmm. My Name is Asher Leib, yeah. um, which I think is actually his most interesting. Mm -hmm. And and he... Um, he, he depicts uh, Ashale, it's slightly autobiographical, I think, um, who was very sick. The parents lived in this tenement, uh, the family lived in this tenement high, high up in, in, in New York. His father was always off on these Zionist rah, rah, rah tours in the, in the 1940s. And his parents who were devoted to each other always had these very romantic and very painful partings. And one of the images that Ashale has is of his mother standing at the at the window, this kind of casement window in there, high up, either four floors up or something, and leaning over like that, so that she, the, 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 so that she and her husband could blow kisses to one another. And so he, who was bedridden because he was a very poorly child, saw her from behind. Um, but he imagined that what his his father saw looking up was this Christ-like, because she was holding onto the sides of the case when he saw this. And so this image of the kind of the crucifying, you know, and this great pain of his family, the, the Jewish pain, but also his own illness and the, the tragedies. Uh, and, and so he started to paint, you know, you may, may know that, you know, he, and he was ultimately not able to remain within the Jewish community because he was being so figurative in his work. Anyway, 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 I was wondering whether there is any connection, whether uh, I never thought about it before, and you've just inspired that. Whether one in one sort of stimulated and enthused or informed the other, or whether they were just two separate. No, no, Angela, I'm very glad you mentioned that book, and I'd actually strongly recommended him. It's a very good read. Um, 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 you know, in in this context, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's well established, really, that um, Potok was making reference to, I mean, it's not slavishly ah, based okay. on Chagall's life, but actually making reference both to Chagall, but also to Lipschitz, who I mentioned, who oh, yes. actually stayed in America. He, he went also in the 40s, he escaped Europe and went to America. Um, and I, so, so yes, there are very strong connections. And I think actually one thing you haven't mentioned, which is even more pertinent, is that later, in as he develops, as even yeah. as I'm about to say, as he develops as an artist, he becomes obsessed by the figure of the crucified Jesus. Because actually, yeah. you go to the great museums of the world, and what do you see everywhere? You know, is yeah. that iconography? So this idea yeah. of a Jewish Jesus martyr figure, which is yet intensely Christian, is a real, a real thorny issue. So it's absolutely relevant. And thanks for mentioning it. Yeah. So you're, you're saying that he was was consciously influenced I mean yes. no no I think he, he, he was well he was well aware of the careers both of Chagall and Lipschitz and their interest in Christian iconography so yes absolutely thank you, thank you so much for that thank you and in fact in the sequel mm. to My Name is Ashtalev which I think is the gift of Ashtalev or I might have the wrong Something way around like, yeah. no, it is that where way he goes off to France mm. yeah. um it is based on I believe St Paul de Vaughan Devons, mm. the setting where he has the artist working because of Chagall being there. And in fact, um, um, Potok himself goes on and does a painting based on 
the image in the book because he doesn't talk about it much but Potok was actually a painter oh, as well as a writer interesting. so he does his own painting mm -hmm. but thank you so yeah. much thank wonderful you. thank you thank you so much Angela um I think actually our programmer Emma has a really interesting question so of she's normally behind the screen as a program producer but Emma do you want to bring yourself on the screen and we must thank Emma for all her hard work behind the scenes. <laughs> much, yeah. much appreciated and valued. Um, so, yeah, just on the uh, Jewish Jesus mm. uh, thing, just to continue, I was just wondering if there was any kind of backlash or, I don't know, critical voices against this depiction, either from Jews, Christians, other artists, um, commissioners, the general public, mm. um, as to whether it's, uh, I don't know, an appropriation of a Christian image that's inappropriate or uh, Jews feeling like he shouldn't be, you know, mixing with Jesus at all or, you know, any, anything that kind of, yeah, was, was there any pushback against the way he depicted Jesus? No, that's a very good question. Um, I think there was debate, but whether it was, I mean, and I think many sort of viewers of the work, particularly I think Jewish viewers might indeed feel uneasy with, with some of this, but I mean, it's interesting. I've actually written uh, quite extensively about it. I mean, there are actually parallels in the Christian world in the late 1930s with the rise of the Nazis. For example, there was a, a well, I mean, there's actually go back and think of Israel Zangville much, much earlier talking about, you know, the Jews being, come on, Aviva, come to my rescue here, but, you know, they've mounted Golgotha. There's, there's a re reference, isn't there, the, to the cross, suffering of Christ and the suffering of the Jews in the present. I can't remember the exact words, but there's certainly a Jesuit priest in the late 1930s who make exactly that kind of analogy. And, you know, so he's not alone. He's, you know, both in the Jewish world, but also in the Christian world for making these links in that historical moment. But it is problematic, I think, you know, um, um, and, you know, when you look, for example, um, uh, in one of the, the Nice canvases, the it's actually the creation of Adam, which I, I showed you, um, you've got, you know, you've got down below, you've got the creation of Adam and then you've got Christ on the cross. And in Christian tradition, and I'm hesitating slightly because I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe there's something called typology, whereby scenes in the Old Testament are seen to prefigure scenes in the life of Christ. There's, yeah. there's also like so, quite a lot of English poetry that-, that Exactly, like, exactly. So you know, this is complicated, problematic stuff. I think, you know, one can't get away from that. And indeed, I, I, one person I didn't mention who's relevant here is someone called Jacques Maritain, who was a Catholic philosopher and a close friend of Chagall, who was actually married to somebody called Raissa, who was a Jewish convert to Catholicism, no less. So the plot thickens. And uh, Maritain, actually, I, I think I alluded to him earlier. I mean, he actually saw that Chagall was somehow a Christian monkey, and Chagall denied that. He thought, no. But, you know, so you know, the debate continues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just in terms of Chagall reception, I mean, what Emma asked is really interesting, but I was also wondering about his reception in Britain. Mm. We know that he was employed by kind of Christians to do Chichester Cathedral, et cetera. But do we know if there was any response from the British Jewish community? That's a very good that? question. I would have to delve into that. That's a nice little project for somebody, if not. Okay. If not no, 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 absolutely. I, not that I know of. I mean, the, 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 the British connections are fairly tenuous. He was also commissioned, and I'm just trying to remember, it was a small alternative theatre, I think it was possibly in the 50s or, certainly, or the 60s, in London to do a stage set or a backdrop, which no longer exists. So that's a kind of intriguing, again, little sort of British encounter. Uh, the Tate has very few works by him. There's a beautiful one from 1915 called The Poet Reclining on in his honeymoon with Bella, which is an absolute beauty. And then one or two other less important works so he's not actually terribly well represented in this country so no you I wouldn't say to you know somebody from elsewhere come to England you know for a wealth of Chagall work and yet we've got Tudor we've got Chichester so yes do you know do come oh <laughs> yeah well thank you so much there's been lots of comments and chat thanking you like lots of gratitude and in a moment I'm going to ask people to unmute so they can properly express their appreciation but before that, just to flag up a couple of things, which is if you do want to hear more from 
Monica and come and look at the windows closely please do sign up for next week because as she says there is nothing like seeing them in person and I've been there once before and you can even see marks from his hands mm. in the windows I mean it, they really are remarkable so um just kind of a really really big thank you for that and please come along for more of Monica on Chagall at Tudley but also um, we're talking, you're getting a little view ahead. We're actually talking about plotting um, a trip to France um, to look at Jewish arts and culture. Lots of people do Jewish trips to do the synagogues and the Holocaust, but we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to go look at the history of Jewish artists and writers? So Chagall Proust and even a little bit of Sarah Bernhard, but also Monica's going to look at the School of Paris with Soutine. So keep an eye out for that, um, which will be hopefully sometime early on or in the middle of 2024. Um, but for more of Monica, go to the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel or the Jewish Renaissance YouTube channel. And there's lots and lots of her talks about some emigre artists um, from Germany mostly, but from all over the place and mainly who settled in Britain. Um, but thank you again for today. It was wonderful. What well, a brilliant overview of his career and really situating his stained glass work. And as I said, we lots of people want to express their appreciation. So please do unmute yourself and just uh, yeah, a round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. I should just mention apropos next week that we're also visiting, as you may know, Item Moat, which is one of the most pretty country houses in the country. So I, you know, it's, it's going to be a good trip, hopefully. A bit far from Manchester. Oh, well, <laughs> if you want to meet us halfway, Gita, maybe not next week, but here's another little inside what's coming ahead. Um, in September, we've had to position it very carefully between Chagim, but we're going to do um, a day in Stratford. So if you fancy coming to Stratford upon Avon, because Tracy Ann Oberman is going to do a special talk. We're going to see her merchant of Venice. Mm -hmm. She's going to meet the group and then we'll visit Upton House, which is another Jewish stately home right near Stratford upon Avon. And the owner, Robert Whaley Cohen, is going to give us a tour. So maybe you could come halfway <laughs> and meet us in Stratford upon Avon then. Well, I have seen her do the merchant. She did it in Manchester. Ah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, I hope to meet you all in person at some point, but if not, see you all on again online. Um, and thank you for all for coming today. All the best. Goodbye. Yeah. And we'll follow up in the email. We'll send you the link to Monica's video and details on Stratford are about to go live. So we will send that information in the follow up and we'll also put in just in case there is any last minute bookings details for item motion tudely for next week have a lovely day everyone enjoy the sun thank you